Exultant is a science fiction novel by Stephen Baxter. It's part of the Destiny's Children trilogy, which itself is a spin-off of his larger series Zeely Sequence. What I want to talk about here is how its Neo-Darwinian or Dawkinsian universe might be the most existentially horrifying of all. Let's start from Richard Dawkins, whose body of work I'll now condense to a single sentence. Sure, Darwin was mostly right, but... and then there's this another thing. The self is gene, now over 40 years old, and while making all its points surprisingly clear, still creates discourse, as not everyone wants to admit to its ideas. This is mostly because people want to feel special, and the selfish gene tells us why we will never be anything more than the sum of our parts. These parts, of course, are genes. Every one of them exists to replicate. Not just the good ones that serve a purpose. It's, it's not only about which is the fittest to continue surviving. It's about competition and compromises where the genes and combinations thereof can make the rest of the species think they should be protected. In a world seen by Darwin, where the only fittest survive, no giant horns or mating rituals would exist as that is just a waste of energy. But in Dawkins' world, the existence of mating dance of the blue-footed boobies makes sense. Cheating your partner to believe you are a fine breeding partner is a great way to continue the bloodline. Think of the most stupid person you knew in 8th grade. Was that person the first one to have kids? I thought so. Another great way of protecting your genes can be not breeding, but protecting your siblings and your mother. Maybe you can't have any offspring, but your mother can have a million like you. Then even killing yourself to protect your mother can be the best way to protect your genes. This is the main idea of Destiny's Children trilogy. What if humans evolved to function like an ant colony? The first book of the series, Coalescent, explores how such society could begin and survive through millennia. Third one happens in a far future of half a million years from now. Then humanity's descendants are born from a queen and will then specialize. Some feed the queen, some walk like spiders, some grow to a giant whale-like beings that recycle waste. Let's focus on the exultant, the part most attached on the Seely sequence. The Seely sequence consists about f- from about f- 5 million books, or maybe that was the length of the timeline of the events. Either way, I have not read all of them, mainly because not all of them were recorded into audiobook form, and that slows me down significantly because I can't read. In Exultant, the year is 25,000 or something. Humanity continues its tour of fighting around the Milky Way. After being occupied by barely describable life forms, they have found a worthy enemy. The Zeely can be found around the black hole in the center of the galaxy. Zeelies live on the event horizons of black holes and are fighting another war against beings based on dark matter who don't even know that humans and other baryonic matter exists. Those two sentences sum up pretty successfully why we aren't drowning in movie adaptations anytime soon. When the story begins, the war has been on a stalemate for 3000 years. This is because both sides have faster than light travel that basically makes time travel a commonplace occurrence. Each side knows all the time about the actions of the other side, so countering them always results into war just continuing. We follow a group of child soldiers, teenagers who only live for for the war effort and are likely to die before the age of 20. Quick side note, I fucking love this novel. I want to say that before anything sillier comes along. Exultant isn't a story about genes or phenotypes, but about memes. 
In the selfish gene, a concept of a meme was introduced. As we now understand it, it's an idea that spreads itself. Here, the meme that spread through the human race was that humanity exists to fight the Zeely. This is spelled out to us in, in these exact words. The frontline soldiers and the, and the more powerful people alike only want to go on and keep on going in not losing. No one has talked about actually winning the war in millennia. When that option enters the discussion, it's confronted with opposition in a form of endless bureaucratic jungle. If an ant soldier lives to protect its queen, a human now lives to serve its civilization. That only exists to fight the Zeely. It's a fascinating mash of Verhoeven's Starship Troopers and Terry Gilliam's Brazil. Stephen Baxter was once asked if he could write a novel in the universe of Warhammer 40k. For those of, we, those of you who are unfamiliar unfami with the lore, everything in the universe of Warhammer 40k only exists to reign war times infinity. Every human and any other being alike should shoot everything inside, ask no questions, and then shoot themselves with a mortar in the face just to prevent the enemy from having a chance to steal your helmet and bullets. Baxter declined. He could not write about totalitarian regime where everyone are forced to war. Sounds contradictory at first, but in his own story, when humans use all the galaxy's resources and kill 10 trillion human soldiers along the way, it happens because everyone are on board with the idea. To quote the anthrop anthropologist Yuval Noah Harari when he was talking about AI and the far future, we don't only need to think what we want, we need to think what we want to want. Unquote. When everyone you ever known sees all non-human life as a sickness, what you will want is to fight that sickness. There is no evil dictator, but a meme that manit manifests into ignorance. As the story kicks off, our main protagonist, Pirius, escapes a Zeely fighter while trying while flying with a speed that sends him and his crew back three years. There they meet themselves as 16-year-olds. The younger versions of them are sent to frontline as a punishment for disobeying orders during future mission they will never be able to actually make. I just wanted to say this because I love this story for the, just for how batshit crazy it is. But I'll abandon the story now. Go ahead and read it yourself. This podcast will remain relatively spoiler-free. I'm not going to dive into that existential horror. When Exultant begins, humans don't yet know the Zilli literally inhabit the event horizon of the black hole in the center of the Milky Way. If you think of it now, the two sides are only barely fighting the same war. Time works differently near the black hole, so if humans have kept firing the Zeely for 3000 years, the Zeely themselves might, have, might just see this as a stormy Wednesday, and they can just wait a week when humans are extinct and the Andromeda galaxy collides with Milky Way. The war is said to have cost 10 trillion human lives. How valuable would you consider a human life in this universe? A human life has no intrinsic value in itself, only in a way it contributes to the war, which contributes to fucking nothing. Did I mention that we never actually meet the Zeely in any of the novels or the short stories? So should the more significant human authorities have any concern about the fates of the lives of those countless soldiers? I find that hard to believe. It is year 25,000. Anti-aging treatments are a thing. One character of the story is Luru Paz. She has remained alive for 20,000 years. 
It might not make much sense for us, but following the themes of the trilogy, the incredibly long-aged ones also developed their own meme. Our purpose is to keep on surviving. So when your age, age reaches five digits, so much data has been processed by the still human brain that you can only remember the parts that serve the same idea. So if you can't breed or serve a queen, one way to, to preserve those genes is not to die. Since these ancient ones are among us and even they mostly care about themselves, how much would an average citizen care about those 10 trillion soldiers that died during what they loved? Furthermore, think yourself as someone who has lived millennia. How much would you care? You know those kids are made for one thing. They are dumb as a boot, they grow in birthing pods, and sacrificing th thousands of them would quickly resonate with your conscience as much as throwing away a used condom. This was explored further in Baxter's short story Mayflower II. It happens partly during ex exultance events in the other side of the galaxy. In a ship heading to the stars, few passengers are made immortal, as all the rest age normally. Long before halfway point of the 50,000 year voyage, the captain meets crew member who introduces himself. I remember that name. Weren't you here just a while ago? No, that was my great-grandfather. It's been a century since you came outside your cabin. That would be a somewhat accurate description of how Luru Paz will remember her encounters with the frontline cannon fodder. So let's say you are one of those big shots. You will see millennia pass and witness billions disappearing in a war. Could you do anything... meaningful? Not really. Even if you'll manage to end all wars of humanity and help it prosper for a trillion years to the future, that's still a blink of an eye, for example, for the Zili. They have planned for much further. And then... There are the dark matter beings, maybe even dark energy beings. None of them will, ne will ever know what happened in this tiny fraction of the cosmos that was made of atoms. So all you could save are just ants whose life have no value, except maybe for you. And even that value would need to be strictly practical, as they bl basically blink in and out of existence from your perspective. So any sentimentality can be thrown away from the start. To distance us more from the true players of the cosmos, Baxter gives short droplets of a story of first civilizations of the universe. This meaning during the first fractions of a second after the Big Bang. How many nations rose and fell and how they fought against the future emptiness that would engulf them as the universe would eventually grow so large that atoms would form. This brings us back to the stories and about you part. We think the universe is fine for us right now. But so was said by everyone ever. In this bo boiling hotness of the universe that was the size of an orange, the young would see the past as a quick glance, while the old w would see those early moments as spanning eons. Because when everything was in one point, you had time to experience everything during that first nanosecond. That might need some more explaining, but just trust me, it almost made sense in context. In the same vein, those who would inhabit black holes in the far, far future would also see our universe now as a blink of an eye. Remember when universe was so young that stars existed? So if the story is about someone, who, it, who is it about? Not you, not humans. If it is about something, it's about beings a human physically can't see or even be able to comprehend. Not at least as long as we decide to stay humans. I'll quickly go back to the story of Mayflower. 
The last immortal eventually merges into the ship's machinery to keep himself alive. While this happens, rest of the crew slowly grow into mindless savages, as no reason to mate with smart individuals is no longer found. This idiocracy trope has been common since H.G. Wells' time machine. But it's still a nice reminder. Nothing matters before the main meme comes to be let's stop being human. So we can inhabit an event horizon? Do you feel special yet? This existential horror is something I have to compare to H.P. Lovecraft. It just goes way beyond it. And isn't made as horror. Baxter often thinks what's theoretically possible as he constructs his stories. I think horror with these ideas would actually sell better. The reason Lovecraft became a household name was the fear of the unknown. Baxter doesn't approach his subject with that, but tries to explain them as well as possible. If you search for art depicting Lovecraftian gods, you'll find pictures. People have bothered to try depicting them. There is no pictures of the Zeely. Because they are two-dimensional? Maybe? We all all can name well-known movies and whatnot with Lovecraftian themes and influences. Mist, Into the Mouth of Madness, Alien series, Bloodborne. One book of Zeely sequence is called Flux. It's about tiny people living inside a neutron star. Now there's a screenplay for radio. I remain to be extremely annoyed by the absence of Baxter's recognition, but I understand that fear is more tangible feeling than almost understanding. I may love this book. I wish I would have found it earlier. But no solo work of Stephen Baxter has ever been translated to my language. That's one of the reasons this podcast shall be forgotten into the darkest corner of YouTube. Other is that it has no video. And how could it? There you have it. A stripped framework of how Dawkinsian universe might be the most merciless of them all. I don't remember who I'm quoting. But someone said, Baxter's universe is sick with life. It's a good quote, but at least it's sickened by the endless forms most beautiful. Now go home and cry yourself asleep, you useless replication vehicle.